we have entered our month of uncommon mercy. Somebody say uncommon mercy. Two Thursdays ago, I was telling them in showers of a story. And it was a story of a pastor. He told the story. He had gone to Maryland. His friend had asked him to come and speak in a crusade um, for him because he had to go to Canada. So the pastor shows up. The only problem was when he got to the place, there was only one person. And this was supposed to be a week-long crusade. Just one person in the hall. And so the associates, if you will, came and tried to console him. Say, yes, sir, sorry, yo. I told them that they should come. They shouldn't go to work or they should come. They should be here. But they are not here. The man said, no problem. It's okay. He said, as far as I'm concerned, once the mic hits my hand, I'm on assignment. So whether there is one or there's a thousand, I will preach. So he takes the mic begins to preach and there is one lady in the hall and he preached to one lady in the hall and at the end of the crusade as soon as the pastor came and said sir as this a week long crusade and on the opening night it's only one person we should just what do you think let's just cancel it last last we'll just one or two just say you know due to opposing circumstances he said, go and ask the lady if she will come tomorrow. So he goes and asks the lady, will you come tomorrow? The lady says she's not sure. So the pastor said to me too, as it stands like this now, I'm not sure. The lady said it's 50-50. Then he says, if there's a 50% chance that she will come, then I will be here tomorrow. So the next day, you know, sometimes these things happen and we will think, I can imagine what I'll be thinking then. I say, God, why didn't you let me know, sir, that this was going to happen? Are you trying to test my side note before I come back to my story? There were times when I, um, some of you might not know, I was pastor of 316 for a while um, before I handed over to Pastor Busoy and then we went to start the cave. Um, and 316, on a good day, on a bad day, 360 was about 300. When it was 300, I would say, where's everybody? You know? And so we were used to, I grew up in, I mean, not in this fine, it wasn't always this fine, but you know what I mean? We grew up with, you know, people. And even 316, people will tell you when you're starting church, 300 is a good number. If you have 300 consistently, you're doing well. So, I was just kind of spoiled, you know, We're used to it. So <laughs> we go to the cave. And it was a small church. We started a small room and, you know, you fill up. And then the first couple of days, first Sunday, everybody comes out because it's something new. First, second Sunday, everybody comes. And after a while, because it's very small, we're in a small room, very humble beginnings. When people don't come, you'll notice. <laughs> you know, and then you start realizing that, is every Sunday you are praying, faith, God, let people come. God, faith, let people come. I remember one time I come to church. Ah, but they were, we were in a room that could fit about 40 to 60. So if it were 40, 50, it was a good, was a good Sunday. And the next service, there'll be 15 or 20. I'm, ah, God, what did I do? Did I? Pastors who have started church, can I get an amen? Thank you. So I said, God, did, did I do something wrong? Is it? But what's this? God, you know, and I realized that God was teaching me something. And one day he asked me a question. He said, will you preach the same way? If there's one person, then there's a hundred. Because if you are preaching, if your preaching is tied to the crowd, if your motive for showing up, can you preach the same way you will preach to a thousand? Will you preach to ten? Because you don't know the ten that is sitting there. It is not about the size. God does not mark how well you are doing. The success of any ministry is not in the numbers, but in the lives that are changed. And once God said that to me, I said, okay. 
So whether there was 10 or there was 20 or there was 30 or 40, that was a good Sunday. Or there was 10 just workers, I will preach the same way. So what you see today is not because we have, been, we have preached to 10, we preached to 100. And now we're preaching to thousands. But the point is, faithfulness over the little. I digress. Let me go back to my story. So the next day, the lady comes. The man shows up. But in addition to the man, so there's the pastor, the associate pastor, and the one woman. Then another pastor came. He said he heard that there was a failed crusade. Yes. So he came to commemorate, commiserate, show his support, just say, yeah, pele. You know there are people who are waiting to see your downfall. <laughs> and they come under these guys of friends. They are frenemies. Because they want to position themselves well. So that when the fall happens, they can have first row seats. Somebody say, oh, come on, mercy. Oh, yes. Say, lie, they will not see it. Yes. So he came. I said that he just came to commiserate, you know. But the pastor said that even when he was preaching, the man was frowning his face. Amen, he will not say. So, sir, why did you come? It's better that you didn't even come at all. So after the second day, we came and the lady came and spoke and she said, Sir, the presence of God is in this place. Ah. He said, yesterday you were speaking about mercy. You kept preaching mercy, mercy. And so I held on to it. And you asked me yesterday if I would be here today. And I said I did not know. And the reason why I said I did not know is because I had an immigration case today. And if they found me guilty, I would be deported. Straight from the, airport, um, from the court to the airport. So I did not know if I would be here today. Said, I've had an immigration case. And today was judgment day. Today was judgment day. The prosecution that represented the state had given all damn... I do not have papers. I was illegal. There was, no, there was nothing to de defend. The prosecution had laid his case, executed it perfectly. What was left was for the judge to read the judgment. She said, before the judge will read the judgment, he asked a question that judges never ask. He said, Josephine, do you have anything to say? The prosecutor said, sir, the time to say anything has passed. Her lawyer is here. He has made the defense. We have rested all arguments. There is no time. Sir, you need to read. The, and the judge said, excuse me. This is my court. <laughs> Whatever I decide is what will happen. So Josephine, do you have anything to say? Josephine got up and she said, she said, sir, I do not have papers. I am not here legally, but all I ask for is mercy. She says, all I'm asking you for, sir, is mercy. He said, I have been here illegally. My mother is in Yaoundé, in Cameroon. And it is this life that I have here I've been using to take care of her and send money home. If I go back today, the moment she sees me, she will die. So please, sir, all I'm asking for is mercy. Please have mercy. Have mercy on me. The judge is looking at the judgment but cannot read it. And then looks to her lawyer and says, you see, there is a clause in the Constitution, subsection so and so, so and so. If you go and look in that area, you should be able to find a way to obtain papers for this woman. Go and explore it thoroughly. 
And when you find and obtain papers for her, come back and I will rule in her, in her favor. Until then, this court case is adjourned. When judgment was about to be read, somebody say mercy. You see, if you look to the scripture, you will find that mercy always supersedes judgment. God is a just God, but there is something, and I will show you how and why, about his nature, that when you appeal to his mercy, mercy speaks. The Bible says that God commanded Moses to put in the ark, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod, and manna, and he put it, sealed it in the ark, but it was under the mercy seat, because mercy will always supersede judgment. Look at your neighbor and say mercy. mercy. We're starting a new series today. And we are starting, and the series is called Mercy Me. Now, it is important that I wanted to, I said, how do I define the word mercy? How can I articulately encapsulate the word mercy that would do it justice? And I was musing, trying to figure out a way to the intro when I said something quite playfully, but it became very profound. And I said, look around. Mercy is you. Mercy is me. If we will go for the definition of mercy, we don't need to go far. Look around you. The fact that you are alive today is mercy. Oh. The fact that we have breath in our lungs is mercy. Because there is nothing that we have done that qualifies us to be here while others are not. Somebody say mercy. Let's jump into it. Let's turn to Romans 9. Romans 9, 15, and then we'll start from there. I want to... Verse Romans 9, let's go 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice with God? Now, a little pretext to that. If you go further up, he's speaking about how God decided that of the two twins, the older will serve the younger. And he said, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And the question is, well, how is that fair? And so 14 is saying, is there injustice that God would decide he would love one and not the other? And the answer, he says, what shall we say then? Is there any justice with God? Certainly not. Now look at this. He says, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whoever I have mercy. And I will have mercy compassion on whoever I have compassion. Mercy and compassion. I will have mercy on whoever I choose to have mercy. I will have compassion. It is from my mercy that compassion comes on whoever I decide to have compassion. So then God's choice is not dependent on human will, nor on human effort. The totality of human striving, but on God who what? Shows to whoever, somebody say whomever, he chooses. It is his sovereign gift. So you see, the beautiful thing about mercy is you cannot buy it. It is not something that can be manipulated. It is tied to the sovereignty of God. There is no amount of works that you will do that will qualify you for mercy. I choose to have mercy on whom I choose to have mercy on. I choose to have compassion on who I choose to have compassion on. It is saying very clearly that mercy flows from the essence of God. Mercy is tied to his sovereignty. You cannot bargain him. You cannot manipulate him. You cannot 
bribe him. <laughs> it is tied to who he is. Now, for you to understand this saying, he says, for I said to Moses, I will have mercy on who I choose to have mercy on. I think it's important that we go back to the conversation that originated this, because Paul is quoting what Moses, what God said to Moses. But before we go back, everybody here qualifies for mercy. Because the, the, the prerequisite is whoever. 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 Now, as much as I've said that, I should say this as well. Mercy is available for everyone, but not everyone gets it. It is available for everyone because he can have it. He's a compassionate God. But not everyone gets it. So now, if I were you, the question I'd be thinking is how do I ensure that me, I get it? Because some people know that you can't do life without the mercy of God. Let's go back to this conversation. Let's go to Exodus 33. I want to show you something. Exodus 33. But I want to go, let's switch to KJV. Exodus 33. I'm going to read very quickly. Bear with me while I go there. Sorry, sometimes, you know, we are using a computer. I bind the devil. I pressed it three times. <laughs> it has refused to go. Uh -huh. Finally. There you go. Exodus 33. Go to verse 12. KJV. And sometimes I, I, I like that we get to the, the point of view we have when we read the Bible is an interesting one because we get to kind of eavesdrop into conversations. It's like reality TV before reality TV, right? We are brought into a conversation that Moses is having with the Lord. Moses is talking to God and we get to hear what was said. This is what Moses says to the Lord. He says, see, you say to me, this is KJV, right? Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways so that I may know you. Oh, this is amplified. That's different. Give me one second. Let me switch it to KJV. Because on my way, that's not right. If I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace, somebody say grace, in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, this is God answering, he says what? My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. So Moses is saying, Lord, listen, listen. You have said, okay, pretty much, that I have found grace in your sight. You have said that I'm your guy, paraphrasing, and this nation are yours. If this is so, okay, show me. Show me your presence. God says, your pre my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. And then he said unto him, this is Moses saying to God, if thy presence goes not with me, carry us up not hence. The conversation was about, Lord, if you say that we are the way you are, show me your presence. This conversation was about Moses getting the presence of God. His pursuit of God was not his works or not the manifestation of gifts. It was his presence. Somebody say his presence. He was saying... I want to feel your presence. I want to know you more. His motivation for the conversation was the presence of God. Verse 16 says this, For wherein shall it be known 
Hear that I, thy people, have found grace in thy sight. If not, thou dost not go as with us. So shall we be separated, I, and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. God says unto Moses, the Lord says, I will do this thing. Also thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. This is somebody that God is saying, I know you by name. And he's saying, show me, show me your glory. In other words, you will never get to a place where you feel like you know it all about God. This was Moses who the Lord said, I know. I speak to face to face. And Moses is still saying, I don't know enough of you. Show me your glory. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, show me your glory. There was a pursuit. Anyone that says they have the formula on God is a liar. You cannot know him. If Moses, who Lord said, I speak to face to face, is still asking for more, there is more to be found. He says, I will do this thing. Verse 19. And this is what the Lord said. I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim what? The name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So this conversation starts with Moses asking for the presence. Show me your glory. If your presence does not go, I don't want to go. The Lord says, your presence, my presence will go with you and I will give the rest. He says, listen, if your presence is not there, I'm not interested. And he says, I will do this thing. And then the Lord says to him, you're asking for my glory, which is my manifest presence. He says, here's what I'll do. And if you read further, it says, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cause my glory to pass. And he says, while I pass, I will proclaim the name of the Lord and after he proclaims the name of the Lord, or when he says that, the next thing that he says is, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy to. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. So in my mind, I began to ask myself the question, why is it, why would the Lord say to him, I will proclaim the name of the Lord? He's asking for his presence. The Lord says, I will show you my glory. Then he says to him, I will proclaim my name. Now, that means there is something tied to this name he's about to proclaim. There is nothing in that conversation that warranted the Lord saying, I will tell you my name. Now, if the Lord is going to tell you a name that you do not know, wisdom says it's important that you hear it. Because God is very intentional. So he says, I will... Proclaim my name, after which he says, I will show mercy. Ah. So in my mind, I am seeing that if we can tap into that name, if we hold on to this name that the Lord is going to proclaim, it is a good way to ensure that mercy and grace will follow. Are you still with me? So when I read that, he said, I will proclaim my name. You know, see, there are certain names that people will call you that will tell you the length of history that they have with you. If you call me a certain name, I will say, oh, you must know me. Because for you to call me by this name, you must, see, names have history. There are certain times where you can be in a fight. You are angry and somebody will call you by a name. And because they are calling you that name, and the person calling you, you will mellow. Can I get, can, can, can I get an amen? Is, is that true? So in other words, there are certain names that unlock certain things. And the Lord says to Moses, I will pass before you and I will proclaim my name. This is the first time the Lord is going to tell Moses, his name. That by himself. So, you know me. 
This name, what is this name? I want to know this name. Do you want to know this name? Let's go and find this name. Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Look at verse 4. And before this, the Lord had told him to come up onto the mountain, bring up two tablets with him. Verse 4 says, And he hewed two tablets of stones like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up onto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tab tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. Aha. And proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Now this is the Lord telling him his name. And proclaimed the Lord. Ha ha. The Lord God. Merciful and gracious. Long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth, <laughs> this is the name that the Lord proclaimed. He says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. So when you appeal to mercy, you are appealing to his name. This is the name that he told Moses. I am the Lord. I am the Lord God. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering. He's telling you his name. You know, where you come from, in your in your language, we have what you call a Ricky, right? When they say you're Ricky, your head will swell. And we've talked about it many times. When you go to parties and they sing your praises, your head will swell. So now you begin to realize that every time anyone has said, have mercy on me, they are calling his name. <laughs> Anytime you utter the name, mercy God. He's like, ah, somebody is called. So now it begins to make sense. In Luke, when he was passing by, Blind Bartimaeus, he says, son of David, have in the midst of the noise, there was a multitude of people surrounding him. But he said, somebody is calling my name. And they told him to shut up. But he said, God of David, son of David, have mercy. He says, I know that name. That name I told to my friend in a secret place. So if somebody is calling me, then he must be in the secret place. So his name, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, forgiving to a thousand. Now, when you understand that this is the name of God, it begins to make sense why David was called a man after God's heart. Because David always knew how to appeal to the mercy of God. Put up Psalm 51. Let me show you something. This is David. Talk about somebody singing your Ricky. <laughs> Psalm 51. Put, up, put, put, put it in the amplified version. Psalm 51, what does it say? <laughs> A psalm of David. When Nathan the prophet came to him after he had sinned, 
he had sinned. Now remember, <laughs> remember, in his name, the Lord said, I am merciful, gracious, long-suffering, forgiving to a thousand. But by no means does not it blot out your iniquity. Right? I visit the sins, those who are guilty, to the second and third. I put the sins of the father on the children, to the second, to the third, to the fourth generation. So I need you to understand that even though there is mercy, as it stands right now, consequence follows mercy. Stay with me. But David, look at David, Psalm 51, amplified version. Put it up on the screen. This is David after he has been caught. He starts with this. Have, <laughs> have mercy on me, O God, according to your words. Uh -uh. You know, wives, when you have upset your husband, you know, if you want to get him to smile, and you know he's angry, there's a way you are approaching. There's certain things that you will say. The tone of your voice will be different. You call him that pet name. And even though he's angry, the more you continue, even if he wants to be angry, there is something about when you begin to say certain words and say certain names that will permeate the anger. David is right before the Lord. He has been caught. He starts, have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your... After all, he said his name is mercy, long-suffering. He, he's appealing. This is who you are. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression. See washing. Look at the next line. Wash me thoroughly from my wickedness and guilt and cleanse me from my sin for I am conscious of my transgression and I acknowledge them. My sin is always before you. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what was evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak your sentence and faultless in your judgment. I was brought forth in a state of wickedness in the sin my mother conceived me. And from my beginning, I too was sinful. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being and the hidden part of my heart. You will make no wisdom. Look at seven. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness and I'll be satisfied. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Look at 10. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right and steadfast spirit within me. Look at 11. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Remember, the conversation with Moses and God started with a presence display. Lord, if you are who you say I am to you, show me your presence. And from his presence came the name. And from the name came mercy. If you always want to walk in mercy, make sure you hold on to his presence. David was a man after God's heart because he was always in the presence. When he sinned and he counted the men in 2 Samuel, and God came to me and said, choose three options. One, farming for seven months. Two, you'll be running for your enemies for three months. Three, pestilence in your land for three days. And David says, I would rather fall into the arms of the Lord than fall into the hand of men. <laughs> because David knew that even in God's anger, his name is mercy. And the Bible says, he sent a pestilence in 2 Samuel. And the angel of death came and smote 70,000. And while he was going to continue, the Lord said, enough. He called him back. In other words, it could have been so much worse. But mercy prevailed. 
Pastor, hard things have happened to me in my life. It could be so much worse. Oh, talk to me, somebody. <laughs> if you look at the consequence of what you should have gotten versus what you got, then you realize that somewhere in the mix, mercy intercepted. Sometimes, when we speak about God's long-suffering nature, when he's long-suffering, means he will allow us to do things that we want to do. And sometimes we'll use our own hands to mess up our own lives. And then when we find ourselves in a messy state, we will now say, but God, if you're such a good God, why will you allow this to happen to me? Excuse me. It is his mercy that has allowed you the free will to do what you want to do. It is his mercy that has kept you in spite of yourself. You see, his mercy, his long suffering, his faithfulness, his faithfulness is not tied to what you do, it's tied to who he is. So it does not waver based on what you do or do not do, which is a stark opposite of human beings. I love you as long as. I long you as long as you are faithful to me. I love you as long as you are loyal to me. I love you as long as, but his mercy is tied to who he is. So David knew how to appeal to God's mercy. I'm looking at my time. Now, here's the thing. Remember, when the Lord said his name, he said, mercy, gracious, long-suffering, all of that. He says, well, ho, ho, ho. Don't get it twisted. It does not mean that those who are guilty will not receive consequence. After Psalm 51, we know what happened. His first son died. He prayed, prayed, prayed. Because the wages of sin is death. And because God is a just God, if I Go back on what I have said and I refuse to be just. He says the rain falls on the just and the unjust. He is so just and perfect in all his ways. If he has said it, he cannot go back on his word. He's not a man that he should lie. So if anybody sins, if you buy, if you eat the food, you have to pay the bill. If you do the crime, you must do the time. I can show you mercy. Sometimes the judge will give you leniency. That's mercy. If the maximum is 20 years, he can give you two years. Guess what? You're still going to jail. That two years is still mercy. So, when he was talking to, Dave, um, to, to Moses, he says, this is who I am. I am merciful. I am forgiven to a thousand. But if you are guilty, you will carry it. If you don't carry it, your children to the thunder for I say, I ah, have ah, ah, God. Eh? When you were doing it, you did not know. Do you not know that there are certain things in people's genealogy that people are paying for that their great grandparents did? Somewhere, somewhere, somebody said something and it has followed them down their line. So, anybody who is guilty based on a crime, the wages of sin is death and those who sin must die so if you and I are in this place today based on the name of the Lord if we have erred and we are guilty there's problem everybody's quiet now because everybody likes mercy without consequence that's what we want but when we were doing it, we did not show mercy when we were committing the crime. Isn't it? Let me tell you a true story. True story. I'm coming back. <laughs> there was a time when I was doing a renovation in my house. And they had taken off all the tin roofs, the aluminum sheets. And they put it in the front. And I stayed in a close. Uh, well, I stayed in the close. And I kind of was friends with all the security guys. I used to tip them so they all used to call me boss. They're all my guys. It's always good to be everybody's guy. Amen? So, unfortunately for this guy, he had come onto the street and saw the aluminum sheets. 
and said that he was going to steal my aluminum sheets that were on the floor. Now, bear in mind, they had replaced it with a new one. So these were the old ones. But people know that you can sell it for iron and, you know, get some money. So the man came to steal. And unfortunately for him, those boys on the streets caught him. They beat. You won't come boss house still, I be shown bah. But see, he had on jeans, they removed the shirt, they pulled it down to like his butt. They were beat. I heard this commotion, I know what's going on. So I came out. But ben, ben, this useless man, that's how we come and steal. They'll say it's us. I said, calm down. I felt so bad for this man. I told him to stop. I said, wait, everybody leave him. I said, what happened? I said, why? Why would you steal? You know, in this country, if they catch you, the consequence is death. Instant, no conversation. And everybody is already angry. So if we are angry and we are hungry, we are not stealing. You that to steal it. We will not show you any mercy. Because we can steal too, but we decide not to steal. So you decide to steal. They beat. I said, everybody, leave him. I said, but you know, he said, why? I said, why did you steal? He said, I was hungry. I said, leave him, sit down. I put him on the bed. I said, go and bring water. See? I said, bring water. Boss, I said, bring water. He brought the water. I said, drink. Drunk. I said, go and bring malt. <laughs> At this time, the guys around were angry. Boss, so I said, relax. Relax. I said, drink malt. I said, see this thing. Don't do it again. Because the consequence is your life. And it's not worth it. I told my guy, go and bring money. Ah, they were angry. <laughs> On top of this person coming to steal, you're not rewarding. I said, relax. I said, take. Take some, maybe a couple of chains, five Ks. I don't remember what I gave you. Five Ks, six Ks. I said, take. Go. Don't do this again. I said, everybody, leave him. The men were angry. But mercy was staying judgment. And this man, although beaten, the guy wasn't even walking well again. No, no shirts, scars on his back. They, and you know what they want to, you see, when is it time to pay the bill? The devil is wicked to the point that not only will he bring the consequence, but shame will follow it. Shame! When they were beating this, they pulled his jeans down so his butt was exposed. So he's walking like... <laughs> and he walked, left the street, and I didn't see him again. Now fast forward to a couple months later, I'm close by the house. I'm trying to find a hall for the cave. We're trying to move. And I hear a voice, boss, 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 boss. And I look. I say, boss, I hear you now your guy. <laughs> and I'm like, I know this face. Who be? I say, now your guy now. Remember me, boss. I you saw his face. He said, boss, I just want to say thank you, boss. I did try now. I did all right. I did. And I realized. This man could have been killed. But because mercy was shown, he came back and he said, thank you. And he was looking better. And I said, wow. But I say that to say, although mercy was given to him, he had the marks of the consequence of his actions. Sometimes, if you judge mercy based on the marks that you have taken, you might not see what mercy has done. Sometimes, your scars are indication of mercy. So, he says, I am merciful, but the guilty must carry. The wages of sin is death. So you cannot escape the consequence. You must pay the price. Now you must understand that in the days before days of Moses, 
the high priest, they had one year, they would come, and it was called the Day of Atonement, where they would come in white, and they must go into the holies of holies, and they would kill an animal, and the priests must come in all white, take off the ephod, take all of that, take all of that, and all they would have are bells on the bottom, because the only way that atonement would be gotten for the people where no one would die is if the priest made it into the holies of holies and sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. The mercy seat where the two cherubim wings connecting, representing the presence of God. So if he would pour blood and he did it because there were processes. He had to bathe. He had to be clean. No bells or whistles around him. And the only way they knew that anything he was still alive was when they heard the jingles, the sound, the sound. Because as long as the sound was heard, the priest was still alive. And as long as the priest was still alive, atonement was made. And an animal had to be killed. Blood had to be shed because the wages of sin is death. Now, you and I, if we put a telescope on our life, if we want to be real, if we do an expose on who we are and what we have done and the consequences, we have eaten so much, we have done so much crime that our bill is overflowing. If they were to put a magnifying glass and they were to put our lives on display, <laughs> You will know that church, we are fantastic actors. Can I get an amen, somebody? You will be shocked that those who look like lambs are actually lions. And those who are look like lions are reformed lions. Because if you knew where God took me from, our bill is overflowing. The wages of sin is death. His name is just. And he must put the sins of the guilty on their children's children. But then there was a lamb that was slain. Before the foundations of the earth. That was slain one time for all. Because somebody must carry this thing. And the Bible says in Romans, no, Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4, 16. And we do not have a high priest. <laughs> Remember, the high priest would go in the day of atonement and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat for salvation. But we have a high priest who shed his own blood. On the cross of Calvary, shed his blood because the wages of sin is death. And although his name is mercy, his name is just. And because he's a merciful God, he must be just to impute judgment on those who are guilty. So we have a high priest who came and shed his blood. He shed his blood. On the cross of Calvary. And he said, it is finished. And the Bible says, the moment he said that, the veil that separated us from God tore. Now remember, the only way they knew atonement had happened was when they heard the bells. And then they knew that atonement had occurred. So it is a little wonder when Jesus told his disciples, tarry, tarry in Judah. Wait until you hear a sound. And the Bible says, while they were in the upper room, all of a sudden, there was a sound. It was the blood hitting the mercy seats. When that happened, they were 
filled. Hebrews 4, 16, put it up on the screen. He says, now, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize and understand our weakness, next line, and temptations, but one who has been tempted knowing exactly how it feels in every respect as we are and without committing any sin, Next verse. Therefore, let us switch it to um, um, switch it to KJV. I, I like this the KJV. Therefore, continue. Let us therefore come what? Come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain what? Aya! So here you have this beautiful picture. The Lord told you his name. I am merciful. I am long suffering. But I impute sin unto a thousand. Sons, fathers on sons, the children on children to the third and fourth generation. So if you are guilty, then Jesus comes and takes the price. And now he stands as our high priest, shed his blood. So now what you get now is mercy without consequence. Because Jesus has satisfied the requirements. He has taken the consequence. He was beaten. He was broken. He was bruised. The chastisement of his peace was upon. And by every stripe. So now he stands as the high priest before the father. And because he has satisfied the requirements. And he has paid the price. He says, you can come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy. Listen, there are certain places that a son can take you that a servant cannot. <laughs> if, you are a, if you are a parent and you, and you want to injure somebody, but your child stands and says, Daddy, this is my friend. This person, because of me, Daddy, leave him. And stands before this person. You cannot injure this person anymore because there is now somebody blocking. And the person blocking is somebody that you love. And the person that you love not only is yours but carries your name. So the Lord, who is merciful and just, speaks to the name that is above every name. And the conversation begins to ensue. We do not have a high priest says he is every day making intercession on your behalf. So when the devil comes with the evidence and says, hey, this person did this and this person did that, then you have your high priest that says, yes, but I paid the price. Daddy, remember, it is your son. And because I paid the price, this one, my blood, my sacrifice has washed him white as snow. Everything you will do to him, you have already done to me. And because you love me, you will not touch him. So Father, put it on me. And when the Lord looks at you, but looks at you through the eyes of Jesus, he says, mercy. Look at your neighbor, say mercy. Mercy. 